Good afternoon, everyone. This will convene our fifth meeting of the year for the Southwest Florida Bankruptcy Professionals Association. Um, the one announcement that I have is that quickly approaching is uh, the Pasquet dinner. I know Mr. Trunkett had sent out a blast email asking for sponsors, um, and I know that we're all busy and we probably wait to the last month or two, but if we could address that with him, um, it can be stressful trying to organize that event, and it should be a great event. Yeah, of course. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, I think both of you are here. The sponsorships are very important. They allow us to have those three meals, the free lunch, if you will. And uh, we've been very, very fortunate. There's no dues, as you know, here. But the amount of for the sponsorships are there. That's the dinner. Really cherish it. So, anybody that can step up to the bar and sponsor, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry. Um, next month, we've got Steve Elmar from 722 Redemption, um, who's going to be speaking on the products that are available for debtors to redeem property rather than reaffirm them. And we have applied for CLE credit for that. And then I know that Mr. Rivera has um, applied for CLE credit for today's presentation. Um, and Judge Delano has a couple, an announcement. I just have a quick announcement and say so you guys will all be in the know. Um, this is something that was shared with the members of the Bankruptcy Bar Association by Judge Williamson at a meeting earlier this week and also announced to our court staff. So if you all recall when Judge Williamson was here doing his State of the District speech, he mentioned that this was his final trip as Chief Judge. Some of you may know that Chief Judges serve for a four-year term. They are appointed by the District Court. So. I'm happy or sad, but I think mainly happy to tell you all that Judge um, Williamson's term is ending September 30th, that the bankruptcy judges unanimously made a recommendation to the district court, and the district court recently entered an order um, appointing me as chief judge for the next four years. I feel like I'm, I'm kind of tooting my own horn, making my own announcement, but I wanted you all uh, uh, to know that's what was... Uh, that's what was going on. So I'm looking forward to being Chief Judge, carrying on the good work that Judge Gentleman and Judge Williamson uh, really have done over the course of the last eight years. So um, my door is always open, or my email box is always open <laughs> if you have any suggestions. Okay, thanks. All righty, and with that, Luis. All right, so I made this a minefield here with my cords. Um, so the, the good news is that you all are the um, few that braved this presentation, and your reward is going to be an ethics credit, one of those sought-after ethics credits. Um, the bad news is that, you know, you have to listen to me drone on about um, local rules. Um, all right, so the, the topic of my presentation today is um, filing on debtor's behalf by court-appointed representatives, holders of powers of attorney, proposed next friends, guardian ad litems. I'm going to talk about some procedural and ethical considerations. Um, and, and what I want to talk to you about is, um, you know, those, particularly the procedural and ethical considerations attendant to the filing of a bankruptcy petition on a debtor's behalf uh, by one of these um, representatives. And so what I hope to discuss is um, some ethical considerations uh, for working with elderly or incapacitated um, clients, including issues related to elder abuse, because particularly in our community, if you have this kind of case, that's what you have. You're more likely to have an older, um, incapacitated client. I'm also going to talk about the appropriate usage of powers of attorney in bankruptcy. Um, you know, what's an appropriate power of attorney um, to file the case and then what you can do with the power of attorney um, or what the holder of the power of attorney can do in the case um, and then talk a little bit about the appointment of guardians and next friends. Um, so, um, getting right to it. Um, what is financial elder abuse or what is elder abuse? Um, you know, it's funny, it's not a topic I've ever, um, you know, personally dealt with. 
Um, it's not, I've never filed a case on behalf of a debtor, but yet somehow this is the third time I've been asked to speak on this topic. I first um, did a, a panel um, with, uh, uh, with Stephanie Lieb and um, Judge Dow um, for the ABI event that uh, Judge Delano had in, invited me to speak at. But anyways, um, you know, I was talking in the courtroom before uh, some hearings with Brian Zinn, and he asked, you know, what am I going to talk about? And I told him, elder financial abuse. He says, what? That's not abuse. Um, what are you talking about? Well, elder abuse can take many forms, and one of the more prevalent forms today, and again, especially in a state like Florida, with a large elderly population is elder financial abuse or exploitation. And the Department of Elder Affairs for the state of Florida, that's right, we have a Department of Elder Affairs in the state of Florida. It defines financial exploitation as the, or elder financial exploitation as the illegal or improper use of another's individual resources for personal profit or gain. And this type of exploitation encompasses a broad range of conduct from uh, deception to intimidation. Now, given that I'm not a, an expert of, on uh, elder abuse or elder financial abuse, I thought I'd turn to the next best thing, uh, YouTube. And uh, it loaded a minute ago. If I can get it to load again, I found a video short two minute that will explain to us. Here we go. Head now. Oh, and now that they're selling this place. How come you still have the keys? How come you still have the code? What, what are you looking for? Nothing, Pop. Go back to watching your show. To give her the key back. Like for I'll be back in a while. Sister. Can I help you? This card doesn't work. Why can't I get my money out of the machine? When I used it earlier, it was fine. Maybe you've exceeded the limit for today. May I see your card? I'm sorry, but this doesn't appear to be your card. Well, it's my father-in-law's, but he asked me to get some cash for him. He needs to go to the store today. Just give it back. I'll try again tomorrow. I'm sorry, but bank policy is I'm going to need to hold on to this and contact Mr. Franklin. If you'd care to bring him in, I'm sure we can straighten out this whole matter. I can't believe this. This woman just tried to commit a crime. By using her father-in-law's ATM card to access money without his knowledge, she was breaking a law which protects elders from financial abuse. This kind of situation happens all too often. Elder financial abuse is a growing problem, and it affects people in communities all across the nation, both large and small. Senior citizens are often targeted for financial exploitation because they are often socially isolated or dependent on others for assistance. Many are easily intimidated or beguiled. One common denominator in financial abuse cases is the presence of a relative, friend, caregiver, or someone in whom the vulnerable adult placed trust and confidence. They illustrate some of the many ways in which elders are robbed of their money. Mrs. Roberts wants me to have power of attorney for her. Can you do that here? Mrs. Roberts, is that correct? Do you want Miss Simpson here to have power of attorney? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Talking She's about. not all together up here, you know. That's why I need to have power of attorney. Well, actually, we don't do that at this office. And One day, an elderly customer, Mrs. Roberts, came into the bank with her caregiver. It looked to me like Mrs. Roberts was very confused. Her caregiver was trying to attain power of attorney. When I told the caregiver that the bank couldn't grant power of attorney and they would need to see a lawyer, she became quite irritated. After some complaining, 
she took Mrs. Roberts and left the bank. I was really uncomfortable about the situation. It just didn't feel right. So I spoke with my supervisor, and he called the local Adult Protective Services office. They immediately got involved and went to visit Mrs. Roberts by herself at home to see if she understood what was going on. APS determined that Mrs. Roberts was not able to make an informed decision and took steps to protect her. The next day, APS called my supervisor. We also contacted all our other area branches to inform them of the situation. It turns out the caregiver had started going to various branch drive throughs trying to obtain funds. To say the least, the caregiver was fired and the police were notified. I can't help but think about what could have happened if we hadn't done something about the situation. Okay. Just give me a cashier check. I said cash. I'm sorry, will you make that cash, please? Mrs. Carlson, are you sure you need that much money? That's a lot of cash. Yes, I really do. The other day, one of our elderly customers came in accompanied by a couple of rough-looking young men. Mrs. Carlson wanted to withdraw $1,800 from her savings account. The situation made me very nervous. Things didn't look right. I want to take it all out right now. Just give me the cash, please. Can you tell me what your relationship to Mrs. Carlson is? It's none of your business. Why don't you just go ahead and do what she asks? Mrs. Carlson, this is a little over my limit. I'm going to need my supervisor's approval on this. I'll be right back. Excuse me for a moment. Based on the training I received, I excused myself and called my supervisor. OK, I'll be right over. Connie, my supervisor, tried to separate Mrs. Carlson from the suspicious characters. Hello, my name is Connie Johnson. I'm the supervisor here. Glad to meet you. I'd like you to come over with me and we can speak about your account. Are you sure you don't? They objected, but she insisted. She's on the account. Thank you. Suddenly, the two guys turned to leave the branch. When I saw the men make a run for it, I knew they were crooks. I hit the suspicion camera button to get a picture for the police and noted the time and date. As it turns out, Mrs. Carlson said these guys were wanting to be paid for work they claimed to be doing on her roof and gutters. Only she couldn't understand why her roof needed work, since it looked okay to her. Instances of abuse by perpetrators intimidating an elderly victim to pay for unsolicited work are all too common. As illustrated in this case, by simply separating the customer from the suspected perpetrators, it can often be determined if the situation is legitimate. It needs to be said. Financial exploitation is one of sort of the, the largest consequences, so to speak. Um, so how do you spot elder abuse? Um, I, luckily, I got this graphic to work. Um, so again, it's the illegal or improper use of an older person's funds, property, or assets. Um, and here are some warning signs. Um, and it's, it's much like, you know, the undue influence type claims, if, if, you know, with uh, probate administration, estate administration. Um, so a sudden change in a beneficiary in a will, um, especially if uh, now the beneficiary, the primary beneficiary is the caregiver, whether it's a relative or not. Um, large crash withdrawals from banking or investment accounts, as well as the use of credit cards. Um, it's funny, you know, I, I don't recall when it was, but I, I do recall a case where um, the case was filed, and I think it was dismissed, um, or, or maybe the court did conduct some sort of um, inquiry into the matter of the U.S. trustee. Maybe I made a referral, but, you know, elderly, um, el elderly gentlemen, um, been bedridden for four, five, six years, yet there's a $3,000 debt owed to Victoria's Secret. Um, turns, you know, my suspicion was that the holder of the power of attorney, the daughter, um, had been um, charging on the, you know, utilizing the debtor's credit. Um, unpaid bills or lack of food in the house, you know, obviously if the money, the social security check is $1,000 a month, um, the debtor's ordinary expenses are only 900 but yet there's not enough money to, put, to pay to the water bill. 
or there, you know, where's the money going? Um, at times, it can be that it's going to a caregiver. Um, and same with missing possessions. You know, things are being sold off. Another um, another warning sign might be, you know, the debtor doesn't know, or the uh, you know the state of their financial affairs and the fact that bills are going unpaid. They say, well, my check keeps coming in, my daughter cashes it, or my son cashes it for me. All those bills should be paid. It's plenty of money. Um, that's another uh, sort of sign. So, um, so that's sort of the problem. Now I want to talk a little bit more practically about you know the issues related to. So client or an individual walks in through the door, the son or the daughter in my hypothetical here, and says, um, you know, my mother, she's incapacitated, she suffers from dementia, but, you know, the debt burden is just something we can't bear. Um, I need to file, you know, we need, we need to get relief. I need you to file a bankruptcy petition for her. Um, one of the first issues that came to my mind, and it's an issue that's highlighted um, Judge Sheneman has a, a, a decision that has a rather lengthy discussion on this topic, um, but is, you know, who is the client? Um, is, is the client the, the son or daughter, the caregiver who came in and wants you to file the petition with them signing as the next friend or the holder of the power of attorney? Or is it the debtor or the, you know, the, 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 the debtor to be? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is it depends, like everything. Um, but irrespective of who your client is, in most cases you will owe duties to both the elderly or incapacitated debtor and the next friend or guardian. Um, and there are a couple of rules that um, one might consider um, in evaluating who is your client or how you're going to proceed. Um, obviously, these are, these are uh, Florida Rules of Professional Conduct, uh, rules governing the Florida Bar. You know, the first is 4-1.7 that deals with conflicts of interest, and in particular, um, sub B, which deals with uh, or imposes a duty to avoid a limitation on independent professional judgment. So. Um, you have a duty to make sure that your um, handling of the case and your representation, presumably, of the debtor, uh, regardless of who the client is, whether it's the debtor or the holder of the power of attorney, isn't adversely impacted by um, your loyalties or, whatever, or duties to the other. Um, it's much akin to like the uh, representation of an insured, where the insurer is paying um, your bills. Um, another relevant rule is 4-1.14, which deals with a client who has a disability. And it imposes on the lawyer a requirement to maintain a normal relationship, whatever that means, um, with the disabled client. Um, you have to maintain a normal client-lawyer relationship with the client, I think presumably with terms of communication. Um, and then sub B with respect to the appointment of a guardian. Um, the rule provides that the lawyer may only seek the appointment of a guardian or take other protective action with respect to a disabled client if you reasonably believe that the client cannot adequately act in the client's own interests. And sort of, you know, one thing to consider is the, the language, the, the rule says a lawyer may seek the appointment. Um, but um, what if you make that, you come to that conclusion, you come to that reasonable conclusion that your client cannot adequately act in the client's own interest. Are you required to take that action? Um, I, you know, the rule obviously doesn't say that, but that's something to consider. Um, interestingly, the comment to the rule does um, suggest that if your disabled client has no guardian or legal representative, the lawyer must act as the de facto um, guardian. And then even if the, the disabled client does have a legal representative, the comment goes on to say that the lawyer should, as far as possible, accord the represented person 
the debtor in this case, the status of client, particularly in maintaining uh, communication. So um, while the rule says may, the comment suggests that you know perhaps you don't have to go out or you can't go out and seek the appointment of a, gar of a guardian, but you have that responsibility as a lawyer. And so the, the Judge Gentleman's decision that I mentioned, um, I think uh, Ryan said he's going to post the slides, um, but it, in case you're interested, it's In re Bentley. Oh, well, that wouldn't be in the slide anyways. Um, in re Bentley, it's uh, case number 6 colon 17 dash BK dash 294 KSJ. Um, it's 2018 Westlaw 1318951 or 2018 Bankruptcy Lexus 770. All right, so let's say you determine that your client or the purported, that the debtor is incompetent, that they're not able to um, manage their own affairs or going back, that they're... Um, in a, in, unable to make adequately consed, considered decisions in connection with the representation, right? Or their ability to do so is impaired. Is impaired. Then what? Well, you know, again, the rule suggests that you may, you, you can seek the appointment of a guardian, but you don't have to. Um, but let's say you have to, or the, or the, the, holder of the power of attorney or purported next friend uh, wants you to or they think it's necessary, they make that decision, then what do you do? Uh, what court makes that determination? Because again, the goal here is to file a bankruptcy petition and get bankruptcy relief for this client or for the debtor. And so a couple of points on this issue. Um, first, perhaps to state the obvious, a person does not have to be competent to qualify for relief under the, as a debtor under the bankruptcy code. Likewise, you know, a minor is entitled to relief under the bankruptcy code. Um, and, and there are several courts that have held that uh, Rule 1004.1 and Section 105 uh, provide the court with the authority to um, grant that relief. Second point is that bankruptcy courts are generally not equipped to adjudicate a person's incompetency, or at least that was Chief Judge Specie's opinion um, in the Petrano case, which is a case that was followed um, by Judge Jenham in the Bentley case, and I know um, Judge Colton has has sort of followed it or cited to it. I, I think it's one of the most thorough analysis of these issues, at least coming out of the Florida bankruptcy courts. Um, state law controls the determination. And, um, you know, sort of interesting tidbit, at least at the time of Judge Specie's decision in uh, Petrano, which in 2013, um, she could only find four reported decisions in which a bankruptcy court had considered the appointment of a guardian ad litem for a debtor. So um, probably the bankruptcy court is not where you want to go. Um, so a couple other things to consider. Um, rule 17C of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure um, has been interpreted to mean that if an incompetent does not have a validly appointed representative, the federal court in which the suit is brought may name a guardian ad litem or next friend to represent him regardless of the state law. So that sort of cuts the uh, uh, both ways. An interesting thing to consider or remember is that Rule 17 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure is incorporated into both adversary proceedings and contested matters. Um, so if you have an adversary proceeding or a contested matter against someone that is um, or may be incompetent, the bankruptcy court does have um, the authority to um, 
take that action. And if the bankruptcy court was to take that action, it would likely, um, I think, need to follow the procedure outlined under um, Section 744.331 of the Florida statutes. Um, and it's a long and drawn out process um, where the court is required to appoint an examining committee of three persons, solicit a report, um, and then conduct an evidentiary hearing, or at least you know some sort of hearing on the matter. Um, and you know the things that come to mind is the time and expense, because again, um, you have, assuming in a case where everything is on the up and up, you have a debtor that needs relief, who's um, um, incapacitated or elderly, and probably doesn't have the resources to go that way. Which takes us to. Um, sort of the next friend alternative that the court has adopted in um, proposed amended local rule 1002-1. Um, um, now, as I asked, I understand from Judge Delano that the judges met um, at the beginning of the week and they approved with some slight modifications, including a modification to rule 1002-1. Um, they, they did approve that rule, so it'll go in effect as revised, further revised on July 1st. Um, and that'll be forthcoming. I had on the table, looks like all the copies got picked up, a copy of the proposed rule. Um, but anyways, um, if, if you don't have um, a guardian before you file the bankruptcy petition or when your client comes in, if they haven't been adjudicated incompetent, they don't have a guardian in light of, you know, what you have to consider again is which court to go. Do you go to the bankruptcy court? It's not really well suited. Um, it is likely expensive. Do you go to state court? That's going to be equally expensive and likely going to be even more time consuming. Um, and so these are sorts of things that you have to think about. Um, the case law suggests that regardless of where you decide to go, that the incompetence representative should act expeditiously because expeditiously, you need to protect the incompetence um, interest. Um, and, you know, it's interesting in the Petrano case, which is, again, Judge Species' decision, she sort of went the other way around. Um, she sent the parties, stayed the bankruptcy case, and sent the parties back to state court to obtain a guardian ad litem um, before she was willing to proceed with the bankruptcy. So, anyways, um, that is a rather long and dragged out introduction to what I really wanted to talk about, which was the proposed rule and the procedural considerations. That being said, I think this is the part that earned us that ethics credit. So hopefully it was not for nothing. Um, so uh, you have the rule uh, 1007, uh, the proposed local rule, excuse me, 1002-1. So it provides the procedure for petitions to be filed by the holder of a power of attorney or proposed guardian ad litem next friend. And what the rule does is it really breaks it down. I know Judge Delano, um, she's the primary drafter of the rule, and she really sat down with uh, what was the existing rule, Rule 1002-1, which was um, adopted effective July 1st, 2017, and looked at you know what kind of problems had we had, how had the rule worked mechanically in the 18 months that it had been in effect, and what could we do to improve it. And um, I do think that this um, really lays it out in, in, a, in a cogent fashion and allows you to just sort of check the boxes. You probably, in preparing the declaration that's required um, with the filing of a petition, just cut and paste and drop it in your Word document and um, fill in the blanks. Um, so the, the revised rule, what it does is it lists all of the information to be included in the, in the supporting declaration. Um, and then in now, in all cases, the prior rule provided something like um, if you didn't do it the way it was supposed to be done, the court would, would issue an order show cause or might dismiss the case. Um, now, and this is sort of the big substantive change, the court is going to schedule a status conference in every case where there's a power of attorney, a proposed next friend, a guardian ad litem, et cetera. Um, and again, it's effective July 1st, 2019. Um, So the first thing I want to talk about um, is uh, powers of attorney. And before I get there, 
Um, sub A of the rule, you know, I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to talk about. So if, the, if, your, if your proposed debtor has already been adjudicated incompetent by another court of competent jurisdiction, there's nothing that you need to do other than um, file your petition signed by the guardian and uh, file with your petition, presumably under some sort of notice of filing. I don't know that I've ever seen it done. A copy of the state court order that appoints uh, the guardian. And then you should serve, I would imagine, both on uh, the trustee, the United States trustee, and all of the creditors in the case so that they're on notice of this um, issue. But I, I, I think that they would be bound, and certainly Rooker Feldman would bar the bankruptcy court, I think, from reconsidering the propriety of that appointment. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about um, sort of the mechanics of how you file a case under a power of attorney, um, and then we'll talk about um, guardians and next friends or next friends. Um, so uh, state statutes govern the extent to which um, one may accept or rely upon a power of attorney and then the manner in which that power of attorney um, should be prepared. Um, so appropriate usage in bankruptcy court. So the, the believe it or not, the cases are split. There are conflicting bankruptcy court opinions on whether in the first instance um, a case may be filed by the holder of a power of attorney. And um, I was unaware, but our own Judge Pasquet had um, in his sort of gregarious way um, spoken on the issue and he apparently at least initially um, was of the opinion that a case filed by a um, holder of a power of attorney was a nullity. Um, it could not be done. So um, this is uh, in the Harrison case, which is reported at 158 BR 246. It's a 1993 decision. Judge Pasquet dismissed the case. And in doing so, he wrote, quote, it takes no elaborate discussion to point out the obvious that no one can grant authority to verify under oath the truthfulness of statements contained in the documents and to verify facts that they are true when the veracity of these facts are unique and only within the ken of the declarant which is in this instance which in this instance is the debtor and not the attorney in fact who signed the verification while the attorney, in fact, may have personal knowledge of how much the debtor owes to her, since she is listed as a creditor, she would not possibly have personal knowledge as to the precise amounts owed by the debtor to each of the creditors. She certainly could not possibly have any personal knowledge of the truthfulness of the answer stated in the Statement of Financial Affairs, which she verified under oath to be true. So I can, I can see Judge Pasquet on the bench just sort of slapping somebody around, whoever filed this case. Um, you know, of course it doesn't work. Of course you can't do this. Uh, fortunately for us in the trenches, um, many of the courts have gone the other way, and I think many of our, and, and I presumably our judges, given that we have a local rule that like not, you know, specifically, explicitly provides that you can do this. Um, and one of the leading decisions is um, the United States versus Sperlin. It's a Fifth Circuit 2011 case where, you know, the Fifth Circuit's one of the few circuit courts to speak on it. I think the Fourth has as well. Um, I don't know that the Eleventh Circuit has spoken on it. I think the Ninth has as well. Um, but that, yes, you can use a power of attorney um, to file a case. But just because you can use the power of attorney to file the case, just because the you know, the attorney, in fact, can sign the petition, uh, verify the statements, and actually make the filing doesn't mean that the att attorney, in fact, can prosecute the case. And the one, uh, you know, sort of wrinkle that I always see is there's a case filed. It's signed by the power of attorney. Um, the debtor's lawyer takes no other action, takes no special action. Um, here we are 45 days into the case, we're at the 341, the debtor's not there. Instead, in the seat is the holder of the power of attorney. Well, nobody authorized the holder of the power of attorney to appear. And section 343 of the code is clear that it's the debtor that has to appear, um, absent some court order. 
Uh, so, you know, we, at that point, we can't, we can't proceed with the meeting. Nobody's appeared. And frankly, you know, that's really where all the issues that Judge Pasquet was complaining about really come out. You know, you ask, um, so maybe this person's been um, incapacitated or been suffering from whatever, uh, dementia or whatever, for a year. Um, but yet, you know, the, the, the disclosure requirements in the Statement of Financial Affairs are two years. And the trustees may routinely ask about transactions that happened four years ago. Um, you really don't have someone who can answer the questions. Now, obviously, if the debtor's not mentally sound, he or she can't answer the questions either. But, um, you know, there has to be um, some core intervention. Um, so, um, again, fortunately, our judges have taken the time to adopt this local rule, and it lays it out for you. Um, subsection B of the rule deals with um, the filing of a... a well, this is the existing local rule, excuse me, 1002-1. Again, um, gives you some of the requirements. So the power of attorney itself has to expressly authorize the holder to file a bankruptcy petition on behalf of the debtor. If, the, but if, the, if just a general power of attorney that gives broad financial powers, that is not enough. It has to expressly authorize the filing of a bankruptcy petition. Now the good news again for you all in the trenches is that with the revised or the, the, the local rule that's going to go into effect on July 1st, it's really not going to make a difference because the procedure is the same regardless. Whether it's filed by the holder of a power of attorney and you're just seeking authority to act on behalf of the debtor during the pendency of the case, or whether it's filed by a next friend who's seeking in essence retroactive or approval of the filing in the first place and the authority to participate. Um, and then again, just sort of reiterating the position I just gave you about being able to act on behalf of the debtor. Uh, both the old rule, or the existing rule, and the new rule provide that unless and until the court or orders otherwise, the holder of the power of attorney is not authorized to do anything in the case. Luis, just one quick question. Sure. Is the status conference going to occur before the 341 meeting of creditors? Maybe. <laughs> uh, it sort of depends in the Fort Myers cases. It's going to depend on when the filing was and when's the next time that I'm down here. Uh, if, it, if the status conference is after the 341 meeting, I think you can probably expect that the 341 meeting will have to be continued. That's likely what's going to happen. So the, the answer is it depends. So I, I haven't talked to Mr. Tardiff, and I don't know how he's handled the situation. Um, the way I've, ha I've handled the situation in the cases where I've been assigned is um, I normally conduct the meeting or I attempt to conduct the meeting. I ask the questions, try to get the information I can, assuming um, I don't have any reason to believe that there's any fraud or, or exploitation. Uh, you know, obviously these are difficult situations. Um, I try not to inconvenience the parties as, uh, any more than I have to. I had a case recently where the um, holder of the power attorney um, resided in Tampa, and the debtor um, was in a, um, a assisted living facility in Naples. And so um, I, I continued the meeting because I didn't have someone with authority. Um, but what I asked the court to do um, when the matter did come up for status conference or on the motion to appoint um, a next friend is ask, you know, basically just advise the court that I had all the information I needed and asked that the relief be granted non pro tonque to the date of the 341. Just ratify it back. Just ratify it back. Um, you know, if there were some fraud or exploitation issues, I think it would be different. But it will be continued. Uh, my personal inclination is, you know, if there's no signs of any wrongdoing or fraud, you know, we need to go through these steps, but I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible. All right, any other questions on that? All right. Um, so that that's... Um, it's powers of attorney, um, appointment of a next friend, and again, uh, under the new, the revised rule that go, will go in effect on July 1st, um, it's a one procedure. The old rule had sub A was, um, this is the procedure if you have um, a state court guardian. Sub B, this is the, this is the procedure if you have um, a power of attorney. Three, this is if you're asking the court 
or sub C, this is what you, what you need to do if you're asking the core to appoint a next friend. And then, you know, by the time you got to sub C, it was incorporating requirements in uh, sub B. And so it, it did, um, you know, I was on the local rules advisory committee when we adopted the rule. Um, we really thought that it would work um, with, you know, 18 years of implementing. It was just, I think it was confusing. And at least here in Fort Myers, I, I, I never encountered anybody that actually filed the motion or at least filed it with the petition. Um, so this is sort of simplified. Um, if I was being a little more crass, I'd say it's dumbed down. Um, it's just really easy to follow. This is what the case law says the court needs. Um, and it's one procedure in all the cases. So um, when you file your petition, there's a declaration required. The petition has to be signed by the holder of the power of attorney, the proposed guardian or proposed next friend. And it has to be accompanied by a copy of the power of attorney if there is one. That's not a change. Um, and then it has to include um, a declaration under penalty of perjury. Um, so sub B1 um, tells you you need a declaration. Um, good news. Sub B2 tells you exactly what should be in the declaration. And um, you all have a copy of the rule, um, so I won't read this for you. It's up on the screen if you don't have one. But in essence, it lays the factual predicate for why the debtor needs to file bankruptcy, why the debtor, or you know, sort of establish that the debtor is incapable of filing bankruptcy for themselves, um, who is, you know, contact information and the like for the proposed next friend, why that person should be the proposed next friend or guardian, um, a statement that um, none of the debts were incurred for the benefit of the filing party. Again, so, you know, in my case, you know, the daughter was the caregiver for the father who was incapacitated and yet he had, um, you know, a big bill at Victoria's Secret. That's the sort of thing that, you know, the, the, the proposed next friend wouldn't be, I mean, presumably wouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't attest to in this declaration. Um, so those are um, your requirements. But, you know, I think in preparing your declaration, once you're, you're getting ready to file your case, you can have a caption with a, you know, a blank for the case number, declaration of Jerry McHale, um, you know, and then just cut and paste and just answer the questions. Um, and that, that should do, do you what you need to do. Um, yes? I have a question. What happens, I've had a case before where it was the son and the dad. The dad sometimes was lucid, but sometimes he wasn't. He was capable of signing it, but it was kind of hit or miss when you would, you know, talk to him, whether he would understand that. Um, the son did have a power of attorney. How do you handle that situation? Or how should you handle that situation? Well, you know, my sense, especially if you have a power of attorney, it's not a new power of attorney. Mm -hmm. um, you have no reason to suspect any sort of wrongdoing or exploitation. Um, I personally would, you know, rather go the extra step um, and have the declaration, you know, prepare the declaration, um, upload with your filing the declaration, and this is where I was going to go, the required documents, and then appear at the status conference. Um, you know, for me, I guess it's more convenient. My office is across the street. Um, I'm here all the time anyways, but, um, you know, I think given the potential liability, I mean, yeah, I think one of the things, I mean, not... I mean, you need to be looking out for these things because you have a duty to the client. But I would also be looking out because I would not want to be a pawn in the financial exploitation, and I would not want to face whatever liability there might be, professional liability there might be, if I allowed myself to be a pawn in the exploitation. So going back to my case where, you know, you have the daughter, I mean, I am... I don't. I'm, I, I felt pretty confident that a lot of the debts were incurred for the benefit of the daughter, and so, you know, it's just a bad situation. I think it's it's bankruptcy fraud, or I would say it's bankruptcy fraud. Um, if I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I made a referral. I don't ever know what happened. Don't know what happened with it, 
but um, you know, I wouldn't want to get caught in that. And so I go the extra step. I'm thinking, you know, aside from having to explain this procedure to your client, it, it's really, I think it's pretty easy and pretty self-explanatory. So I'd personally go the extra step. Yes, Greg? One of the issues that can be particularly problematic is you'll have someone come into the office, they have a general durable power of attorney existing, might have been existing for a, a you know, substantial amount of time, but now they need to sign a bankruptcy specific power of attorney. And is the client at that point in time lucid enough to execute on it? And so so I've, I've come into those situations. So, so Greg, the good thing about this procedure is that you have to do the same exact things regardless of whether the durable power of attorney is, is going to work mm -hmm. or whether you have a bankruptcy specific. Um, and so, you know, just sort of, I mean, within that hypothetical, I would just stay with the, with the durable power of attorney and file the case as a proposed next friend, um, have that comfort, because I think I would always be weary of the potential undue influence claim, you know, is there some, you know, I have three siblings, you know, we all get along great, but I've had lots of cases where siblings got along really great until something happened and mom and dad died, and that's when everybody is at each other, and, you know, the one sibling who's the holder of the power attorney thinks she is just doing the best job she can, and, you know, the others don't. Uh, Mr. Trunkett. So, that, so that's a good point. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it, uh, but the rule does require that you serve a proposed local rule 1002-1 does require that you serve a copy of the petition, the declaration, and the declaration on the debtor, all creditors, the United States trustee, any governmental entity from which the debtor is receiving funds, social, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, that kind of deal, food stamps, and the debtor's closest relative if known. Um, so you do have that service requirement, um, and, and I guess that cost can be onerous. I wonder if, do you, if, so you have to serve the petition, but the petition is technically only four pages. Do you have to serve the schedules? I'm thinking no, and um, the judge in the room is shaking her head. No, I would think um, you might serve the notice of commencement. Mm -hmm. We don't call it that anymore. The notice, the of, notice of chapter seven, seven right. case. Uh, serve that in the petition, I think, would be good enough. Um, and that raises a really <laughs> good point, Luis, which is um, I don't know that anybody's checking for that kind of service. Uh, and maybe. Um, maybe um, the final version of the rule ought to include a provision, a statement regarding um, the debtors of the family members. Uh, so then check for that. Um, that might be an idea. So that's a, that's a good point to come up. It's a good, good question, Joe. Um, well, I think that, so the rule, and that, that was, I was quoting from the rule in terms of the service, it's the debtor's closest relative if known. That's the language that the drafter used. Um, and so, you know, it, I, I think that that's this specific as you can be in a local rule. I mean, I guess, you know, next of kin, I mean, what, I don't know that that's any more specific. Um, and then there's that if known. Um, so again, um, so, you, so you file the case, um, you attach a, you file the case, and you have to have a declaration. Um, sub B2 tells you what the declaration has to include. Sub B3 are the other documents that you have to include. Um, some medical evidence, because the court needs to have some sort of a record to make, you know, that the debtor's incompetent and be able to make this determination. The case law says so. Um, a debtor, a letter from a debtor's 
caregiver. Yeah, and let me just interrupt. The final draft of that yeah. word of, of the rule is going to take out the letter from the debtor's caregiver. Okay. If you have a doctor's letter or something along those lines, that'll be sufficient. And then there's another tweak to the rule, which will be posted June 1st to be applied July 1st. Another tweak that provides that if you have that medical letter, you can file that under seal without getting an order um, authorizing you to file it under seal. And you're going to want to make sure that you follow whatever procedure it is to file it under seal. Well, right, but it, it's really easy to do is that. It? It's just a CNECF. Um, provision and it's one of the things that's authorized to be filed under seal without a prior order directly authorizing you to do so. So if you have, you know, something really confidential that you don't want to be public record, you can include that um, under seal. If it's just like a vague thing, maybe people don't really care, but just just think about filing them under seal. And it's the, it's the same sort of thing that you all have been sending to the trustees and the United States trustee, um, you know for certainly as long as I've been on the panel, and except now that it'll, it, you know, since it's gonna be on the docket, we're gonna protect the client's uh, confidentiality. And then again, like we've been talking about, a status conference will be set, um, and at that status conference, the court's gonna consider um, the filing, the authority, you know, what authority that person had. I guess that's when I would think that the court would look to the United States trustee and the case trustee, perhaps, if they had any concerns. Yeah, and let me just hype up a little bit here. I would say um, the purpose for the rule, and, and generally, I think we'd all probably agree with Judge Pasquet. You know, why? Who can, who can possibly testify regarding the debtor's financial affairs if the debtor's not available to testify? But the, the purpose for the rule is recognizing that we have an aging population, and we're seeing more and more of these situations. So the, the first thing I'd ask you to do if you have a client approach you about filing a bankruptcy for somebody else, the first threshold question is, why does a bankruptcy need to be filed? Because a lot of times, these are people that are judgment-proof anyway. Their only income is Social Security or some pension. They don't have any savings. They don't have any assets. Why do they need to file? Sometimes it's someone that's getting tons of telephone calls from creditors, and so it's a harassment issue, and they just want to put an end to it. That's a possibility. Sometimes it's someone whose home is in foreclosure, filing a bankruptcy, buy a little time, get a house sold, do something along those lines. Um, but you really do have to question why is the bankruptcy being filed, number one. Number two, I would say that most of the times when these cases are filed, it's filed by a spouse, okay? And, and when it's a spouse, you're not really too concerned about it. You know, the husband has Alzheimer's or is in a nursing home or is physically incapacitated, unable to come to a 341 meeting. You know, that's, that's you know, pretty routine and really not uncommon. Sometimes the spouse is able to sign the petition and then and knows that a bankruptcy is being filed. And then what happens is there's a motion to excuse the spouse from attendance at the 341 meeting. So if that's what your situation is and you've got a competent, you know, a husband and wife, both are competent, both can sign the petition, you're not concerned that one's taking advantage of the other, you know, then, then maybe think about just filing the, the, the petition on behalf of both of them and asking to have the spouse who can't physically or maybe mentally focus on the 341 meeting or stress. I had somebody who was distressed, you know, couldn't deal with it. Think about seeing if you can get them excused from the 341 meeting. That's always easier if the trustee consents. The trustee has to be comfortable that the trustee's gotten all the information that the trustee needs. Um, also, we see, we see them filed by children on behalf of elderly parents. And then, you know, that kind of, you kind of wonder, why is a child filing this bankruptcy? What's the real reason for the bankruptcy being filed? Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's a child that lives with the parent or, you know, caretaker for the parent, and there is a legitimate reason for filing. But that kind of maybe puts your hackles up a little bit. The, the question is, um, do you really see any prejudice to the debtor by virtue of the bankruptcy case being filed? And you have to realize that uh, when you're filing a bankruptcy, uh, there's a trustee appointed, the trustee is going to take control of assets if there are any, there usually aren't any. It's not a situation where it's a family member exercising undue influence or running roughshod over the, over the debtor or the, you know, the debtor's assets or something like that but you really do need to look at that. Now, I have never had a case where it's a neighbor 
or a friend. I have to tell you, I would be, you know, antenna on high alert if it was a neighbor or a friend. Why is this neighbor or friend so involved? But on the other hand, I also have to see if there's a legitimate reason why the debtor is protected or best interest in filing the bankruptcy. And, you know, I'd be looking at that. And I'd also be looking at what is the downside to the debtor. I've never seen a person file on behalf of someone else an asset case. Okay? So, you know, that really hasn't been that really hasn't been too much of an issue. But you just have to be, you know, like looking behind the situation, why is this bankruptcy being filed? That's really the most important question you have to ask yourself. And Luis referred to a case that was filed by somebody not in this room where these issues came up. Why was the debtor filing? Why was the daughter filing the bankruptcy? Oh, I think it came out. The daughter got in a lot of money from the debtor. And the, the, the case was dismissed. And at that point, it's like, well, you know, there's an issue there. And it's not really a bankruptcy court issue. And, you know, and maybe the daughter was the... Um, I think it was the only child of the debtor, and maybe the debtor would have wanted to have given $25,000 to this daughter <coughs> over the course of the last year. Um, if, if the debtor's not getting discharged, you know, if the case is being dismissed, not really, from my perspective, a bankruptcy court administration problem. But we have tried to make the rule user-friendly, not to encourage people to file bankruptcy <laughs> on behalf of, you know, other, on behalf of other parties, but to, to make it possible for a child who sees that, you know, you know, goes to take care of dad one day and sees the foreclosure notice and the house is going to be sold next week and maybe something can be done to salvage that. And we're usually talking about this, the times that I've seen it has always been in the context of a Chapter 7. I mean, it, it could very be in the context of a Chapter 13, but that's a tougher one where you've got a plan B. So that's a little, that's really a little less. And Judge Pasquet's case was a Chapter 13, so I think that's... Right. That would have been be, a that, factor. That's really a, a tough one, yeah. Yeah, because at that point, you're saying to the debtor, fund a plan, <laughs> and you, you are doing something to the debtor. But usually, other than getting a discharge when someone didn't want a discharge, well, why wouldn't they want to, you know, you know, sometimes there's a prejudice to getting a discharge. Why get a discharge this year when you may need a discharge two years from now? And that also brings up the medical bill issue. Sometimes that's a reason that there's a lot of medical expenses. But you really ask yourself, is this person judgment proof? What's the point in firing? Yes, sir. I think Chapter 13, if you pick up you get a situation where you file the case, and at some point in time in the case, you think the person's not really capable of making decisions. This rule broad enough to, to file something then at some point in time? Well, I think that you got to go back to the, the ethical rule, 4-1.14, and I don't know that you can or want to make that decision on your own. Um, you know, perhaps if you had, you know, the Chapter 13 is offering you some sort of reasonable compromise, Chapter 13 trustee is offering your client some sort of reasonable compromise, and maybe... Um, I did have a Chapter 7 case that converted. Um, I think it's still pending, but um, you know, I remember meeting with the debtors um, and the debtor's lawyer, so not in the room, and discussing the issues in the case and a resolution of it. And we had a very reasonable proposal on the table, but the husband was just, it was just nothing that he was going to agree to. I mean, he just needed a dis Chapter 7 discharge scot-free, no asset, and they had like an undisclosed PI claim even. I mean, there were assets in the case and there was just nothing you could do. Um, and that would have been one where if I was the debtor's lawyer, I'd love perhaps to have this rule to be able to corral the husband, but I don't think that that's what it's for. Please. Yes, sir. Um, I noticed that for a power of attorney, is there no documentary requirement? Just a copy of the power of attorney. Just if, if it's a power of attorney that authorized the filing of a no. bankruptcy. And you need a declaration, too. Right. right. But there's no physician's letter or anything no. in that instance. Because if the rule's written, it says only for um, guardian ad litem or next friend. It doesn't specify power of attorney as well to have the attack required. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take a closer look at that to see if that's some oversight. 
you know, if you've got a state court guardian or a state court conservatorship, that's all you need is that court order. You can do whatever you need to. And you think about it, that's somebody that's managing the, the debtor, you know, financial affairs and, you know, figuring out what's going on. And usually you think in those circumstances, if there's a guardian or a conservator you would, by a state court, you usually think that there's some assets to be protected or something like that. Um, if, it's a, if it's a power of attorney that specifically authorizes the filing of a bankruptcy, then you're in a much better position, and when I say much better, but Louise said a few moments ago, you're really in the same basic position because we will allow the filing by someone without a, without a power of attorney. Right, because normally that wouldn't follow someone who would want to not appear at the meeting of creditors. So you, I would imagine that you would always want some sort of documentation. Well, right, because, you know, I could give, I could just say today, you know, I'll give Brooke my power of attorney. I just trust her. She can handle everything, okay? Well, does that mean the trustee doesn't want me to appear at the reporting of meeting if I'm confident? I was initially thinking that one circumstance, you might have a circumstance where your your debtor leave, you know, is on military service, you know, abroad, is deployed, and, you know, and I was thinking, you know, maybe they can't sign the petition, and they want to file, and they might have left behind with their spouse. I have had those cases, um, but I'll tell you, going back to the meeting of creditors, the United States trustee is always required that the debtor appear, even if it's telephonically, at four in the morning in Baghdad, in order to make you know the one o'clock meeting, and we've um, you know in, in most places in the world today it can be done. Um, and on that point, uh, and sort of following up on Judge Delano's, um, so on the motions to excuse or the requests to excuse the debtors or a debtor from appearing at the meeting, um, I'm. I can assure you that it's neither Mr. Tartar or I that are the rub, but it is the United States trustee's position that no one other than the United States trustee can excuse um, the debtor from appearing. And I think that that's probably, I think that that's act, probably our. Although act I right. grant those motions. Yeah, they, they, they don't like that. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? We won't, we won't. You know, if it's like, you know, husband and wife, wife's in the nursing home. Right. Yeah. But I think, yeah. though I think um, your chambers in particular are good that you will only grant them if the trustee, trustee or the U.S. trustee consents. Right. And then, you know, and so, but anyways, my, my practice pointer there was, if your debtor is not available or, you know, there's some medical condition, please reach out to us early. Because I have to run it up the flagpole to the assistant United States trustee in Tampa and get permission to, you know, make, and even if you just need an accommodation, um, I, I, Mr. Martella made a request this week, perfectly reasonable. I'm just sort of, you know, I want to make sure that my master is happy. Um, so I send an email to Pat Tinker, who's our AUST, CC Stephen Wilkes. Here's the request. Here's the medical note. This seems reasonable. Um, and we got like a treatise back on <laughs> telephonic <laughs> appearance. <laughs> and he's a hundred percent correct. But help me, help the trustees, help you. Reach out to us early. Um, please appreciate that. You know, you know, every everyone in life has a boss, um, and you know, we've got to run it up. And well, the earlier. Well, a practice pointer. Does it make sense to file that kind of a motion? And let's say it's a husband and wife situation. Does it make sense to file that before the 341 meeting? Or does it make sense to file it after you've conducted the 341 meeting with one of the spouses present so that you have a comfort level hmm. that you've gotten all the information that you need? Well, generally, so, so I would, a couple things. One, I'd suggest you don't need to file the motion at all if you, I mean, if, if the debtor, so one, if it, most cases, what they're asking is for a telephonic appearance. So um, the one of the debtors is um, competent, is lucid, but is medically unable to travel, um, and so they want to conduct. They're willing to appear, and that's the U.S. trustee's position: is that there are accommodations that can be made, um, much like um, in the Lester case, where Your Honor ordered the debtors to appear at a 341 despite the fact that they were living in North Georgia 
um, you know, they had to drive to the U.S. trustee's office in Atlanta, um, and at that point, you know, someone there swore them, and we conducted the meeting at Con uh, telephonically. So in most cases, accommodations could be made to satisfy the debtor's needs. Um, if, and then on the excusal, I think the United States trustee, you know, is reasonable on those requests, um, but you just, and, and I, I would not file the motion at all, personally. Well, that's, that's probably a good thing for the judges to explore with the trustees and the U.S. trustee of the best way of handling that. I know when um, people file motions to continue three, four, and five meetings, we're like, we're not involved with that. You just deal with the trustee. So. Mm -hmm. But I grant those motions. All the yeah. Time. I think the U.S. <laughs> trustee's position is that the, the you know, provides the debtor shall appear. Right. And the argument is 105. Let's yeah. Of course, if the debtor can't. That's right. Right. And we all get the same result. Mr. Zinn? Uh, it looks like this would apply to minors as well, right? Minors who need to file bankruptcy, something files for them? I think so, because rule, I think 1004.1 of the big rules deals with lumps, minors, and incompetence. So how would you handle the declarations that are required about a person being not able to handle their... Well, wouldn't you say the, child, the child's 12 years old? You know, you know, had, had some money because what? You know, some reason. So it's hurt some debt. It's normally like a 16-year-old, 17-year-old car accident. Right. Seven, six, seven-figure liability now. I mean, they might be able to handle their affairs, mm -hmm. right? Well, there is a there is a big rule that governs minors. I yeah, it's 1004.1, and I'm gonna yeah. put it on the screen if I can. Get it to work. I had my video work. I wanted to show you my movie so that all my work was not for naught. <laughs> so rule 1000. Looks like I'm frozen. Oh, there we go. So this is the big rule that governs. I don't know why the format got changed. But if an incompetent or infant infant, or, you know, it obviously doesn't mean a little baby, <laughs> may file a voluntary petition, and this is the rule that governs, but doesn't set forth a procedure. Right, so I think that's what our rule is for. But then why doesn't our big rule numbering match the, why doesn't our numbering system match the big rule? Hmm, I'll have to think about that. I have, to ask the, I have to ask the drafter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm it, not does sure. It, does a caregiver still have to send a letter saying that the debtor... We've taken that off. That. We've taken, that, that's coming off. Oh. So if you, if you have a matter of... Oh. Well, but it's a minor. It's a minor. You're not going to have a letter saying that. That's what I mean. Well, you know, it's a rule. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's meant to be broken. <laughs> child, the parent to file a police report against the child, 
you know, that's a, that's a real problem. So it could be that the parent or undue influencing child is coming to the bankruptcy lawyer to deal with the kid's financial problems, okay, without the necessity of kid making a, a fraudulent, you know, a fraud allegation in a police report that's going to bounce back and harm the person that's come to talk to you. And that right, opens up a whole other can of worms, and what do you do? Because, you know, you know, I guess to the extent you have a duty to that person, they told you a crime's been committed, do you have any duty to report it? No, probably not. You know, attorney clients are the top. You may be attorney, but right, and depending on the age of the child, is that the well, no, well, the thing is, is that maybe what the child should do is go file that police report and report it as a fraud. That puts you in a very bad position. I'm glad I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of those issues and the elder abuse and the fraud issues, I mean, those are things that the trustee and the U.S. trustee in the court that are all, you know, mandatory reporters are looking at. But, um, you know, certainly issues, um, I think from the attorney's perspective, you know, my big fear would be, um, you know, one, protecting the interests of the elderly or the incapacitated and, and you know and like judge delano pointed out seldom is a bankruptcy discharge a bad thing for um you know the Unless elderly it uses up your right to get one for another well that's years. right you know that's the bad thing but. but um you know it's one way i a lot of the cases that we see a lot uh, you know don't make it upstairs to the fourth floor are um the elderly you know, who have been taken advantage of, though it's, you know, often, um, you know, it's, it's romantic relationships um, or just, you know, phishing schemes or, you know, scams. just scams in general. Yes. Um, but, you know, a lot of the concerns, the financial, the elder abuse, things like that, I mean, those are oversight concerns that the U.S. trustee is concerned about, that the U.S. trustee duties they've delegated to the panel trustees, and then, um, you know, the court's always concerned. So, all right. With that, if you have no more questions. Awesome. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead if you have a question. I just want to make oh. one more little comment. No, no questions. <laughs> uh, one thing I, I should have mentioned earlier, we do have a new United States trustee for Region 21. We do. I remember her name. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's from Indianapolis. She's a Notre Dame graduate. She has a um, really great um, CV in terms of working in private practice, big firms, really sounds top-notch. She reached out to all the judges to introduce herself. Um, she is not moving from Indianapolis, but yeah. I don't know what difference that makes to us because the U.S. trustee was always in Atlanta anyway, so you know, Atlanta and Indianapolis is playing right away. It doesn't really make that much difference. But she sounds great. And then the other thing is that I understand that um, Patrick Tinker had been doing double duty between Delaware and um, the Middle District of Florida, and from Tampa, he is, I guess the commute isn't working out well for him and he's going to stick to Delaware. So there will be a new assistant United States trustee, the, the, the chief person resident in Tampa um, will be appointed at some point in time. So yeah, they've advertised for that position. I think it's still open. Well, ad well advertised for someone for a replacement. That's right. Right, but, but I'm talking more about in the management of the U.S. Trustee's mm -hmm. Office. So Cindy Burnett was like a longtime mm -hmm. official assistant United States Trustee. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is a trial attorney with the U.S. Trustee's Office. I don't think they're the official court assistant. But anyway, so we can expect uh, that to happen. The judges were interested in knowing um, when we get to meet with her, what are the U.S. Trustees, um, you know, sometimes they have I don't want to use the word agenda. Sometimes agenda sounds like it has a negative connotation. But sometimes the U.S. trustee has certain initiatives that the U.S. <laughs> trustee would like to see their staff attorneys, you know, 707 motions to dismiss or all sorts of things. So we don't have any information about that yet, but, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll have somebody that's good and reasonable and does a good job, which this woman's stellar, stellar um, qualifications. So I think she'll be good. I was trying to find her name, but she was like the general counsel for like a big bank, Chase or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And she is a um, interim. No, she's not. She's it. But she, she's she's not. She didn't have. To she doesn't have Senate confirmation for this seat. No, because she's in Region Six also. Because she's already. I guess you only have as a U.S. trustee. Take Senate confirmation 
presidential nomination, Senate confirmation, something like that. But you only have to have it once. And after that, they can transfer you around, and you don't have to be confirmed all over again. But she's been confirmed already. So I don't think she's in or ever acting. I think she is the U.S. Filed away the email. Hey, she's your boss. She is. <laughs> it's more more like my master. Um. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I'll um, pass the CLE code on to Mr. T Tolentino when I get it.